Um, well, welcome to the SOAS School of Law Inception Lecture. You join us at an exciting time. The building site you just saw outside will, over the next 18 months, be transformed into a state-of-the-art facility housing the School of Law as the sole academic department within the north block of Senate House. In tandem with our physical transformation, we're introducing radical new undergraduate and postgraduate degree structures to enhance student choice and underline our historic claim and future ambition to be the first school of global law. One committed to providing students with a critical understanding of the role of law in the world today and dedicated to producing highly skilled, civic-minded, critically engaged and independent thinking scholars who will continue the, tr the tradition of contributing to their communities as countless SOAS Law alumni have done in the past. As a prelude to these developments, we've already embarked on an ambitious period of expansion, almost doubling our undergraduate cohort and growing our academic staff by almost a third, as we add even greater depth and variety to our traditional strengths in domestic, international, transnational and regional law. In the recent research excellence framework, known as the REF, but held in slightly higher regard than the type found on most football pitches, the SOAS School of Law was ranked fifth nationally by reference to the proportion of world-class publications we produce. Whilst in the most recent Guardian Law School League table, we've re-entered the top 10 for the first time in over a decade. So, exciting times, none less so than tonight, where the School of Law is honored to welcome Geoffrey Robertson QC, who has kindly agreed to give out in second ever inception lecture. Now, the more acute among you will have noticed that inception has two general meanings and refers either to the beginning or alternatively to graduation. This, of course, is neither. As Martin said to me, that's very so as, of course. It was originally planned as a lecture to kick off the academic year last October, but postponed due to my little local difficulty last summer. I'm consequently personally very grateful to Geoffrey for making time again in his busy schedule to give this lecture this evening. And it is a very busy schedule. Frankly, Geoffrey's CV puts us mere mortals to shame. A Rhodes Scholar who studied law at the University of Sydney in Oxford, was called to the bar in 1973 and took silk in 1988. Geoffrey has appeared in many of the landmark media, constitutional and criminal law cases of the last 40 years both in this country and beyond, including the prosecution of General Pinochet and Hastings Banda, and the defense of Salman Rushdie and Julian Assange. He's also appeared in several hundred reported cases in the Court of Appeal and made a large number of submissions before the House of Lords, Privy Council, and latterly the Supreme Court, of course. He's also sat on the other side of the bench as a UN appeals judge and as president of the War Crimes Court in Sierra Leone, which indicted Charles Taylor. At this point in my notes, I'd scribbled, Jeffrey is the type of high achiever that reminds me why I decided not to go to the bar. <laughs> but then I looked at his, ac his academic achievements. His book on international law, Crimes Against Humanity, is now in its fourth edition, and doubtless sells more in a week than my term on property law, still in its first edition, has sold in the past five years, notwithstanding my captive audience of eager and not so eager second year so as property students. Add to that a host of learned articles and various other monographs, and I now am questioning how I have the temerity to even describe myself as an academic. Suffice to say that Geoffrey is a leading figure in both the theory and practice of law, and it's our pleasure to welcome you to SOAS this evening, and to hear whether international justice is indeed a contradiction in terms. Ladies and gentlemen, Geoffrey Robertson QC. Well, thank you, Paul, for that overkind introduction. It is a good time to be talking and thinking about international justice because all of a sudden, there's not very much of it around. I say all of a sudden because if you think back just three years to 2011, its future seemed assured. Mladic and Karadzic were on trial 
the architects of genocide at Srebrenica. Charles Taylor had been convicted for mass murder and mass mutilation in Sierra Leone. Laurent Gabot would be the next stop at the ICC, the International Criminal Court, uh, for war crimes in Cote d'Ivoire. The Security Council seemed to have adopted the responsibility to protect doctrine requiring humanitarian intervention and prosecution for crimes against humanity, and Colonel Gaddafi was the first to be indicted under it. Bashir had been indicted over genocide in Darfur, Kenyatta and Ruto over that brutal election violence in Kenya, and on the streets of Damascus, hundreds of brave young students had begun their march under banners that read, Al-Assad to the Hague. Well, most of them are now dead. Their hoops trampled along with their banners. And I think they're owed an apology, <coughs> or at least an explanation for why international justice so failed them. It created expectations that we can see in 2015 and should have seen in 2011 have not been fulfilled and perhaps cannot be fulfilled. The point at which Assad should have been indicted was after a month of bloody Sundays when his troops had mown down several hundred and then several thousand. Uh, at that stage, peaceful protesters, and when the protests had in consequence become not so peaceful and uh, he'd uh, burnt a few hundred by using chemical weapons, 73 nations at the General Assembly called upon the Security Council to refer him to the ICC prosecutor. Uh, of course, Russia, his great ally, simply vetoed the resolution, joined by China, which is generally not always opposed to international justice. Bashir still struts the African stage the prosecutor has, in effect, dropped the case, telling the Security Council last October that she's given up because states, even those that have ratified the treaty, the Rome Treaty, will not do their duty to arrest him. The trials of uh, Kenyatta and Ruto have collapsed through intimidation of witnesses, sabotage of the trial by the Kenyan government, according to its prosecutor. The African Union has mounted a campaign to neuter the ICC, calling it a colonial court with a fixation on Africa, notwithstanding that almost all its actions relating to Africa have been either requested by African states themselves or directed by the Security Council. Libya refuses the court's direction to hand over Gaddafi Jr. for trial, although uh, I think his mansion in Hampstead uh, is still being squatted, and no doubt the LSE are still profiting from his donations. <laughs> Rafik uh, Harari's murder remains unsolved, despite an international court that's been working on it for years. <clears throat> and of course, uh, and always, there is to be impunity for the torturers of the CIA, and of course for any Russians who colluded in the downing of the Malaysian airliner. And in Bangladesh, so-called international justice has become truly oxymoronic. An international crimes tribunal is there busy sentencing to death for international crimes those who just happen to be leaders of the opposition. Fifteen of them have been sentenced so far, and one has gone to the gallows after many thousands of Bengalis uh, <laughs> protested because they thought that uh, he was only getting life imprisonment. So is the world abandoning the fight against impunity? Uh, or have we come far enough in the delivery of what I'd call the Nuremberg legacy 
so the, namely that perpetrators of great crimes must be punished uh, for the sake of their victims, for the sake of deterrence, that we have enough precedents, enough principles and institutions to recover from our current setbacks. It's ironic to read the General Assembly debates on the ICC a couple of months ago. Uh, its chief defenders were Cyprus, Australia, and Montenegro. Its chief opponents were Sudan, Syria, and Senegal, uh, although neither Sudan nor Syria had ratified the Rome Treaty. But they were calling, as were other states, for a reversion to state sovereignty, to what international lawyers call the principles of Westphalia. Now, that's a reference to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 that settled the Thirty Years' War upon principles that lasted for several centuries and are being reasserted today, the principles of Machiavelli, uh, set out in his book, The Prince, and endowing the prince, the king, the emperor, the leader, with sovereignty that was unassailable except in relation to aliens who may be within his territory. In relation to the treatment of his own people, the prince could not be called to account. And that Westphalian sovereignty principle has, as I say, been the law of nations. It certainly survived until Nuremberg established international criminal law, and there are calls around the General Assembly for, it to, for us to revert to it. The best thing about the Treaty of Westphalia, I always think, is that England wasn't part of it. It, uh, only three months later, uh, we put our king, Charles I, on trial, charged with war crimes, with torture of prisoners, with pillage. And uh, the statute that put him on trial reads thus. It is setting up a trial for the king, I quote, to the end that no chief officer of state may contrive the enslaving or destroying of the English nation and expect impunity for so doing. So the word impunity in its Kofi Annan sense first comes into English law in that statute of the rump parliament. There is to be no ever, no matter how high you are, no matter what uh, diplomatic protection you may have, uh, you can have uh, the, there is a rule of law above you. But there never was a rule of international law until quite recently. In the 19th century, we got as far as accepting that piracy was an international crime and uh, there was universal jurisdiction. Any country uh, who captured a pirate could uh, hang him or occasionally her from the yard arm or, or from the uh, uh, whatever gallows could be set up. Piracy was the first international crime. And then uh, gradually we had slavery, uh, certainly uh, in the 19th century Britain. And it wasn't until I think 1878 and the Treaty of Berlin that other countries <coughs> agreed to outlaw piracy. There was the first international court was proposed in 1821 to be set up in Sierra Leone uh, in order to grant uh, piracy warrants, warrants to intercept ships suspect and seize ships suspected of piracy, and it was to have a British, a French, and a, an American judge. Uh, the Americans pulled out at the last moment, plus a change, but uh, that was a start. The idea of humanitarian intervention had actually been uh, pioneered by Cromwell and his uh, Kissinger, uh, who was the poet Milton, 
in relation to the Duke of Savoy, way back in the 1650s, who had threatened any of his own citizens who didn't convert to Catholicism uh, would be hanged. And uh, Cromwell and Milton threatened uh, intervention by British forces uh, if he carried out uh, this uh, dastardly plot against Protestantism. But it was, I think, the Hellenic movement, which really led, of course, by Lord Byron and by the poets, really did first argue for the right of humanitarian intervention in Greece uh, against the Ottoman Empire. They fought, and in terms that are very, have become very familiar over recent years, <coughs> over the question of whether Britain should intervene. They fought, of course, against the great Tory uh, real politician, Lord Castle Ray, the Foreign Secretary, who felt that we shouldn't, no matter what atrocities the Turks committed, we should uh, keep them as a bastion against <coughs> Russian expansion. And uh, for Byron and the uh, Hellenic movement, uh, it was essential that Britain should intervene to prevent atrocities. And Castle Ray, of course, was condemned by Shelley, was condemned by Byron. Posteri after Castle Ray died, Byron wrote, Posterity shall ne'er survey a finer grave than this. Here lies the bones of Castle Ray. Stop, traveler, and piss. <laughs> it was, uh, that was the, of course, uh, the Hellenic movement triumphed. Britain did intervene. It led the first, uh, I suppose, modern intervention in the Battle of Navarino, where the British fleet with the French and Russian ships defeated the Turkish and Egyptian fleet and uh, paved the way for Greek independence in 1832. We didn't, didn't give them back the marbles, but we gave them independence. And I like to think that the first real, uh, the first amazing support, and it was amazing, for the idea of international courts and international arbitration came from, in 1870, from William Gladstone. It, it came over the Alabama, which was a ship that had been sunk by the British Navy wrongly at the time. Uh, it was a, a long-standing dispute between America and Britain, which they finally agreed to submit to an international court. It was, I suppose, the first international court. It had a judge from Britain, a judge from the United States, and judges from Italy, Switzerland, and Brazil. And it awarded massive damages against Britain, quite unfair damages looking at the case. And Gladstone said this, harsh in its extent and punitive in its basis, this judgment is. Yet it is as dust in the balance compared with the moral example of set by two proud nations going in peace and concord before a judicial tribunal instead of resorting to the arbitrament of the sword. Well, they were fine words and it was a fine example and people started to write seriously about the prospect of international courts after the Alabama arbitration. But none had arrived by the time of the First World War. <coughs> if you read Oppenheim and the, the classic texts on international law in that period, you see statements of the kind, no matter what atrocities are perpetrated within a sovereign state, uh, Westphalian principles preclude uh, any uh, intervention, even uh, the, the purges of the Jews in Kishinev and so on were mentioned as being uh, incapable under law of uh, calling for uh, international help. And the first time we get that call is in 1915, and what uh, was uh, truly the Armenian genocide 
uh, after the Dardanelles, on the eve of the Dardanelles invasion, uh, the intellectual leaders of the two million strong Armenian community were rounded up in Constantinople, now Istanbul, and disappeared. Uh, laws were passed requiring every Armenian to leave their homes and to march for hundreds of miles through the desert where most of the women and children died either from marauding or from rape or from uh, typhus or starvation because they weren't given food and they ended up in concentration camps in places that we only know of because they're now occupied by ISIS. Uh, and of course expropriation laws were passed uh, uh, for taking away all their so-called <coughs> abandoned property. They were forced out and, uh, and expropriating their churches, uh, at Christian churches in their homes. So that um, the, uh, that called forth an international declaration from Britain, France, and Russia uh, condemning this crime. And it was first, the first draft of the resolution said this was a crime against Christianity. The Russians uh, accurately pointed out that not everyone was Christian, and so they called it a crime against humanity. And they promised faithfully to prosecute the perpetrators, and that's, that's the first time that we see this. Of course, they didn't, and Hitler was able to urge his generals shortly before they invaded Poland uh, to use the most utmost severity because, after all, who now remembers the Armenians? The British remembered them long enough to round up 68 of the perpetrators in 1918 and take them to Malta for trial. And uh, then they discovered that there was no international law under which they could be tried for following the orders of the young Turk government. They were killing uh, Armenians because of their race and religion, but uh, they were Armenians within the Ottoman Empire and the Westphalian principle prevented prosecution except by an international treaty. And so Britain and France, uh, with uh, American support at that time, uh, set up the Treaty of Sevres, which was part of the Versailles deal in which uh, an international court would be set up to try the perpetrators of the Armenian massacres. Uh, of course, <laughs> that quickly uh, dissipated. Russia lost interest because of the Bolshevik Revolution. They weren't having any part of it. The French did a deal with Ataturk who came to take over Turkey, uh, they wanted oil, and uh, the British slowly lost interest and sent the, the more prisoners uh, that they held in Mort Malta back to Ataturk under his promise to put them on trial. Of course, the minute they landed uh, in, in Constantinople, they were treated as homecoming heroes, and uh, they weren't tried at all. There was no War crimes trial after the uh, First World War, Lloyd George and F.E. Smith had gone to Versailles on the slogan, hang the Kaiser, they wanted the Kaiser. And they set up Article 225 of the Versailles Treaty has an international court, five judges to try the Kaiser for uh, aggression, for the invasion of Belgium, and for unrestricted submarine warfare. They were the two crimes he was to be tried for, but uh, he was given, thanks to American uh, underhand support, because Wilson was very much in favor of, uh, you know, of sovereign immunity, uh, they uh, uh, allowed him to go to Holland, where he lived unhung uh, until 1941. Uh, there was an element of losers justice. The, the Prince of Wilson insisted that uh, the uh, Germans should try their own war criminals. 800 of them were tried in Leipzig and uh, 795 were acquitted and the others were allowed to escape. So that was loser's justice. The League of Nations had no real impact. There was no, uh, there was 
an investigation into Japanese crimes in Manchuria. The investigator, Lord Lytton, refused to travel by air, and it took him nine months by ship to get there, by which time the puppet state of Man Manchukuo had been set up. And uh, much the same happened when uh, the Italians under Mussolini used poison gas in Ethiopia in uh, 1935. So we, we have a, a complete failure of international law uh, at this point to provide any sort of justice. And I think, interestingly enough, that we can trace the beginnings to uh, a little group of English socialists under H.G. Wells and Lord Sankey, who was the Labour Lord Chancellor, in the late 1930s. They formed a, a group to uh, draft a binding uh, charter of rights which would be capable of enforcement by an international court. There was H.G. Wells, Barbara Wooden uh, was there, J.B. Priestley, A.A. Milne would motor up from Pooh Corner to uh, add to the draft. And it is a wonderful, beautifully written document that uh, sold many copies when it was published as a Penguin Special in 1939. And the Foreign Office was so entranced by the idea of ending the war and having uh, international justice that they translated it into German and dropped it on the Nazi tanks as they were coming through France. Uh, they didn't stop to read it, of course, but uh, the person who did was a friend of Wells. Uh, it was President Roosevelt, and it went to inform his Four Freedoms speech that we're fighting for a world based on four freedoms, freedom uh, of speech and religion, freedom from hunger, often forgotten, and fear. And uh, at the Atlantic Charter in January the 1st, 1942, declared human rights as a war aim. And it was then the intellectual input that led to the London Charter in 1945 and to the beginning of international criminal law at the Nuremberg trial. And it was a, <laughs> it was a near run thing. I mean, Nuremberg really uh, almost didn't happen. Thanks to Churchill, Churchill, uh, for various reasons, thought that uh, it would be a disaster to give Hitler a soapbox of the dock. Uh, his suggestion, he drew up a list of the 75 top Nazis, and uh, the minute they were captured, they were given six hours to say their prayers, and then they'd be shot. And uh, that was the British position as what to do with Nazi war criminals. Truman and his friend Robert Jackson, who became the prosecutor in Nuremberg, uh, said in a marvelous letter to Churchill that uh, this wouldn't sit on the American conscience or be remembered by our children with pride. We have to give them a trial as fair as the horrors of the time permit. So uh, there was a complete uh, standoff. The, between Britain and America over whether Nuremberg would ever happen. And the casting vote, of course, went to the third ally, Joe Stalin, who loved show trials as long as everyone got shot at the end, <laughs> and uh, he voted for Nuremberg. And uh, Nuremberg, 23 defendants were processed within a year, um, 20 were convicted, some were hanged. Um, it, set down a legacy, but was it, was it really a, f a false start for international justice, or at least a bit of a deceptive start? Uh, it succeeded, it produced an, uh, a record to defy Holocaust deniers uh, ever since, and uh, it was incredibly popular, uh, and it's become a legend. But it succeeded, as Jackson, the prosecutor, uh, wrote, because of the Teutonic habit of writing everything down. They had all the evidence. They had Goering's signature on the night and fog decrees, and, and it was uh, a relatively easy prosecution. 
very different in Sierra Leone and places where you have to draw inferences from mass graves, where you have to protect witnesses at great expense and with some difficulty, too much difficulty, uh, it turned out in the Kenyatta and Ruto prosecutions. It was also remarkable that the defendants played along. I mean, uh, it's, uh, Goering initially called them all together and said, look, we're going to, this is uh, Victor's justice, we're going to say only three words to this court. Um, the catch cry of one of Goethe's warrior heroes, loosely translated as kiss my ass. And uh, as time went by, they realized they were going to get a fair crack of the whip. They were going to be able to defend themselves. They were able, going to be able to go into the witness box and make such excuses to posterity. And they played along. They were prepared to play this adversary system in the hope of being acquitted, as three of them in the end were. So that was another difference from today when prisoners all too often sit truculently in the cells and refuse to have any part, or like Milosevic, play to the, and Karadzic too, play to the gallery and uh, refuse to uh, play fairly. The third reason why Nuremberg succeeded was the enormous public hostility to the Nazis by the time uh, the trial had ended. In fact, the three who were acquitted could not be released for two weeks because of the determination of the German people to uh, revenge uh, and to hang them. So uh, they had to be guarded. But it was the one of the legacies of Nuremberg to provide the basis for the Human Rights Commission headed by Eleanor Roosevelt to draft the Universal Declaration of, Indo of uh, Human Rights. And it was in 1948 that we get that great, tri really a triangle of human rights uh, institutions, the Universal Declaration, the Genocide Convention, and the Geneva Conventions coming a couple of months later. And of course, they spawn all sorts of good conventions. We get over the next years, we get the uh, conventions against racism and apartheid. We get conventions for the rights of children and uh, conventions against torture and so on. And I, there was someone said surveying the killing fields of Rwanda years later, the road to hell is paved with good conventions because they, they had absolutely no enforcement mechanism attached. There was, under the Genocide Convention, uh, a, a duty imposed on states to intervene, but otherwise uh, there was no enforcement. There was no court, no police force. And uh, so you get the sort of joke that I encountered in Sarajevo in the early 90s. Uh, what you do to a man who murders another man, you send him to prison for life. What you do to a man who murders 20 other people, you send them to a mental asylum until they're cured. What you do to a man who kills 200,000, well, you send him to Geneva uh, for peace negotiations. And that, of course, was a joke about Milosevic, and it got rather blacker, as here in Europe uh, it was impossible to stop uh, the killing. And uh, it was very much as a fig leaf for its failure that the UN, in 1994, uh, set up the ICTY, the court to punish uh, former Yugoslav uh, Milosevic, the Croatians, and so forth. And then that played so well and seemed to work. The, tell you, the intercepts from, from the Bosnian Serbs suggest that they were actually worried about indictment by this new court. Uh, they set up another uh, for Rwanda, the ICTR. And then 
but of course, nothing happened for years because NATO uh, said it wasn't worth risking the life of one NATO soldier to arrest any significant figure. And it took Madeleine Albright and Robin Cook to insist that arrests be undertaken. And towards the end of the 90s, we get some of the concentration camp combatants, and then we get the generals, and then finally we get Milosevic, and now Karadzic and Malaric. And of course, at the end of the century, we had the Pinochet case, which riveted the world's attention on the possibility of ending impunity, on the possibility of international justice. General Pinochet, uh, some of you younger people may not remember, came to Britain uh, to take tea with Mrs. Thatcher. Um, <laughs> actually, it was whiskey. And uh, he was placed under uh, house arrest, even though it was a form of mansion arrest, uh, for 18 months. And Jack Straw, uh, perhaps the greatest uh, thing he ever did, was to withstand so much pressure. He got pressure from the Pope, he got pressure from the Pope in waiting, he got pressure from the Americans, from the Latin Americans. He even got pressure from Fidel Castro, a sworn enemy of uh, Pinochet, who said that the detention was an insult to Latin American heads of state. But it was the end, uh, it was a breach of the Westphalian principles to detain the head of another former head of uh, a, fr a friendly state uh, for deportation to uh, Spain to be dealt with. Of course, he uh, beat the rap by claiming uh, illness. But uh, meanwhile, the courts, international courts, went uh, what seemed to be a very effective way. The ICC had been agreed at the Rome Treaty in 1998. Uh, it was thought it would take years, decades, before 60 state <coughs> states signed up. In fact, they all 60 states signed up by 2002, and that's when its jurisdiction began, begins. Uh, today, there are 123 states which have ratified the International Criminal Court Treaty, um, although that doesn't include America for historical reasons. The, later, the Obama administration has been virtually an associate member. But the trials themselves have turned out uh, in, have had some difficulties. They're very long. It's remarkable to think back that Nuremberg was one year. The prosecution case against Milosevic uh, alone took three years. Uh, the length of time uh, has really been appalling. Uh, they become very expensive, uh, just as they take an enormous length of time. Uh, they take uh, extremely, uh, they are extremely costly. And uh, so it was hoped that these were teething problems, that international justice would, would uh, quicken that it would become less expensive, that uh, it would become more effective. Uh, it seemed, those hopes seemed to be justified. The ICTY dealt effectively with about 160 Serb, uh, Croatian, and uh, Albanian defendants, and uh, most of them were convicted and sentenced to prison. They can't be uh, given the death penalty. The uh, Rwandan court seemed to be working. The ICC, uh, while it took until 2012 before it had its first conviction for running child soldiers, uh, was at least underway. And with the resolutions, resolution 1971, in 2011, in 2011, asking the ICC prosecutor to investigate the situation in Libya, and Resolution 1973, which required or asked or invited NATO to take, I quote, all necessary means 
to protect the citizens of Benghazi against the Gaddafi assault on them, uh, it seemed that we were getting to a stage where uh, the responsibility to protect was uh, coming true. However, as we know, Libya has come apart and currently refuses to surrender Gaddafi. This is partly because whichever government, and there have been several, and it's not clear at the moment which government is in power, uh, want to string him up from a lamppost. As that's, uh, it seems clear that uh, they want both him and al Sanusi to die. Um, but in any event, the government can't uh, surrender him because he's being held by a militia in Zintan. Then there has been the failure to arrest Bashir, which has been all the more embarrassing because a number of African countries have welcomed him, uh, hailed him as a great figure, and refused their duty to arrest him, even though uh, some of them have ratified the ICC treaty. And when um, Mansouda, the prosecutor, went before the UN last October, she said, look, I just can't uh, bother because states are not upholding their duty under the treaty. Um, I can't be, use my resources to maintain uh, the evidence collection in relation to Darfur. I'm going to use my resources on other cases and uh, in effect give up on Bashir. And then of course uh, just recently We've had the disasters uh, in relation to Kenyatta and Ruto. I was very doubtful as to whether that case was appropriate for uh, the ICC because the idea of the ICC is as a court of last resort. It's only when you cannot prosecute in a local court and preferably as a result of an international war that you should resort to the ICC. <clears throat> but what happened in Kenya was that uh, although the riots and about a thousand people died uh, in the course of uh, an election violence which was fermented, uh, there was strong evidence at the time, by uh, Kenyatta and Rutu who were leading opposing parties, um, it was Nonetheless, obviously a case for local courts. Kenya has many judges and many courts and an able DPP. But, uh, of course, the problem was that they wouldn't prosecute. And after a special court, which had been recommended by Parliament, uh, the government refused to set up, the matter was sent to the ICC, and the ICC prosecutor just thought she had the evidence to begin with, but uh, witnesses were intimidated, witness, one witness was killed, uh, there was uh, the government of Kenya would not allow her access to necessary documents, and at the end of the day, uh, she could not continue. <laughs> so, and, and we look around and, and there we see uh, the killings in Nigeria, in Libya, in Iraq, and in Syria, and still no action, and the Security Council uh, refusing to take, even to send the case of Assad to the ICC prosecutor. So, is international justice, with all the hopes that had been uh, raised in Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, all uh, human rights NGOs had supported it, had urged it, had promoted it. Is it, must we say, to any surviving anti-Assad protesters in the early days of 2011, was it all an illusion? Is it really the case that international justice is only possible when it's in the interests of powerful states? Is it the case that real politic will intervene? It's pretty clear that 
Rutu and Kenyatta got off the hook when it was necessary for them to deal with Al-Shabaab violence and killings, the, the, the killings in the mall. Uh, that was the point at which the in powerful states in the international community said, okay, well, if you're a head of state, you shouldn't, uh, you, you should go and deal with those um, atrocities and not sit in a dock in The Hague. Um, that, that is the African Union position that no head of state should be indicted, uh, which of course will encourage heads of state to remain heads of state for as long as they can. China will always shield North Korea, no matter what happens. Ukraine, there's been no accountability for Russia's breach of international law. So that is, if you like, the uh, pessimistic position that we seem to have arrived at only three years after uh, things seemed to be so bright. But there is another view, another story, because particularly when you see how recent international <coughs> justice, the idea of international justice had been, Nuremberg was a precedent that went into the deep freeze uh, during the Cold War, was only picked up as almost an advertising gambit by the UN in 1994, and has, uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, created principles, created precedents, and created institutions that are up and running and may yet deliver. 123 states have ratified. There have been extraordinary developments in, that have been inspired by international justice in Latin America. There have been trials in Argentina, in Chile, in Guatemala for genocide, in Rios Montt. Um, Hissan Habre is finally, and thanks to the African Union, on trial in Senegal for those crimes against humanity, the mass torture and murder that he committed when he was dictator of Chad all those years ago. There is an African Court of Human Rights, which is now going to be accorded some form of international jurisdiction, although we have to wait and see that. The Human Rights Council has been far more effective than its predecessor, the Human Rights Commission. It has uh, brought in the very, very powerful uh, report on North Korea by Michael Kirby. Uh, it, a very good report on Sri Lanka uh, on the killings of 40 to 70,000 Tamil citizens uh, at the end of the war. Uh, it has uh, a, a team that is collecting evidence on Syria in case Bashir or some of his generals become available. Um, there is, I think uh, we can say this, a much greater human rights consciousness. Uh, Forty national truth commissions have been set up. Uh, there is, in so many countries, a documenting of crimes, preserving of evidence, the development of citizen journalists contributing. So, bearing all that in mind, I don't think uh, it's time yet to despair. And the true test may be coming up. And that is, of course, the test that has been finally, uh, finally the, um, the glove was thrown down by the Palestinian Authority when against enormous pressure from, Brit from America and shamefully from Britain, uh, they have signed up to the International Criminal Court and the investigation started on January the 16th. And it's not Africa, so the African Union is supportive. Uh, it is a, uh, it, it will be a true test. Because given the kind of crimes that were committed, one has to say, last year 
in that in Gaza by both sides, the shooting of rockets that were killing civilians, the tunnels that were in, in with the, on the Israeli side, the killing of 2,000 people, enormously disproportionate, many of them women and children. Um, there are uh, certainly war crimes on both sides to investigate. There are uh, indictments to be handed down. It is, it will be, I think, the ultimate test of the ICC and uh, we'll see whether it passes it. I think um, whether it does may depend on whether it gives in to the pressure that it's currently being subjected to because Israel's response to the prosecutor opening an investigation was to immediately freeze the Palestinian Authority's tax revenue, about $120 million a month, which comprises two-thirds of the Palestinian Authority budget. Uh, Israel collects it on the Palestinians' behalf and is supposed to pass it on. And this will effectively bankrupt the Palestinian Authority. And uh, it's also lobbying Congress in the states uh, to withhold the 400 million that it gives to the Palestinian Authority each year. Now, that seems to me to be utterly wrong. And if America succumbs to Mr. Netanyahu's current visit and current uh, request that that money be withheld, that will show, that will be a terrible blow to international <coughs> justice. It will underline the pessimistic view that uh, it is really becoming, uh, all that is left is uh, when it uh, suits the, um, when it suits the great powers. It doesn't suit them to have an independent and impartial investigation or prosecutions in relation to Gaza. But given what we saw of Gaza last year, given the deaths uh, on both sides, the behavior on both sides, it may just be that this is a situation made for international justice. So there I think we've got to leave uh, the struggle for international justice, perhaps with the comforting thought that it has not gone on for very long. Uh, there was that millennium shift in 2000 away from Westphalia um, and reached its height in 2011 with the adoption of the responsibility to protect, now shifting back to realpolitik. But the world is now more aware, I think, of the human rights principles and precedents. And I think I'll offer this as, as a final and rather gloomy thought, that the real danger is that justice will be replaced in so many eyes and by so many nations with its real opponent, which is lynch law. No one talks of putting ISIS leaders on trial. We just want to bomb them and kill them. After we've dealt with the Taliban by killing its leaders on drone strikes. Bangladesh, uh, you can pick up my report, uh, free, greatest, and for nothing, uh, as you leave on the Bangladesh International Crimes Tribunal, which is ordering 90-year-olds to go to the gallows who just happen to be leaders of the two opposition parties where thousands of people demonstrate uh, for their execution. In Libya, the real reason why it's holding on to young Gaddafi is that they want to string him up. Are we, is the world accepting and adopting this uh, idea 
that we can replace the justice of the trial by decapitating suspects because that is what in so many places we are doing. And the great thing, in a way, about international justice is that it doesn't accept the death penalty. And this is very difficult to explain, particularly to Americans. I was, uh, I was one of the British uh, team to consider with the Americans what to do about Saddam Hussein, how to put him on trial, what punishment he should have. And the Americans were plumping for the death penalty. Uh, we said, no, life imprisonment. Um, what? Life imprisonment where? Oh, Finland, where they're all going. Finland, he'll have 120 television channels, most of them showing pornography. He'll, he, He'll, he'll, his wives will be allowed to visit him, uh, and so on. So uh, I actually suggested <laughs> that uh, we should do to him what we did to Napoleon and put him on St. Helena. And to my surprise, the Foreign Office took this idea seriously <laughs> and uh, inquired of the St. Helenans whether this would be, whether they would like Saddam Hussein. <laughs> and they said, well, we're trying to develop a tourist industry down here, <laughs> but, and we think not. So in the end, he went to his uh, obscene, the videoed end uh, on that camera recorder that you may have seen as he was strung up. So it's not easy, but uh, I leave you with the gloomy thought that uh, we may be, at least for a while, uh, on all sides thinking that the penalty should be death, and indeed, death without trial. Thank you for that illuminating lecture. Um, Jeffrey's agreed to take questions from the audience. I've been told I've to warn you that you will be videoed. So you will be videoed just for posterity, no other reason. Um, we do have a microphone here, so there's a hand here, there's another hand there. You... Uh, thank you for an excellent lecture. My que two questions. First one is, there's a major amount of the war going on at the moment is non-state actors. How can we have international law when one group can actually be almost excused from the powers of the law while state actors are, are covered by it. Mm. And the second, everywhere, every time there's war reporting, there's always this proportionality issue, um, especially with Israel, where proportion, okay, 76 Israelis died, 2,000 Palestinians died. But nobody's actually sat down and worked out what the proportion normally in war is how many civilians to uh, combatants are. Mm. And the amount of weaponry that Israel invested in Gaza, they could have wiped Gaza off the map in days, mm. but 2,000 people died. Don't you think the word proportionality is well past the sell by date? <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Proportionality is a lawyer's word, and lawyers don't know what it means. It means what, the, what courts choose it to mean. It's, it's a European word that comes to us, and I don't think it makes any sense to, anything, to anyone in the British tradition. It seems to me to be entirely subjective and quite wrong to have, for example, as a basis for criminal liability. I think you can say that uh, 76 soldiers dying compared to 2,000, uh, many of them civilians, women and children, is disproportionate, and that in itself is the basis for an investigation to see whether, for example, uh, rockets were shot towards churches uh, in Gaza, knowing that women and children were, hiding, were, were, were um, seeking refuge there, uh, because, uh, so that can be used as a trigger for a war crime, but I don't think 
that it should be used uh, in any other way other than as uh, the basis for an argument, certainly not as uh, incorporated into some sort of law. Um, I do think, uh, I don't think, however, that the problem of non-state actors is as great as people make out. Uh, the pirates were non-state actors, and we have a basis for, I, I mean, it seems to me ISIS, although it pretends to be a state in the form of a caliphate, uh, and Boko Haram and so on, are committing genocide. I, ISIS uh, is uh, killing Coptic Christians because they're Christians. It's killing Yazidi Christ uh, Yazidis, whatever they are. They're, um, they have a religion and they're being killed for it. So um, I don't think there is any difficulty uh, in prosecuting non-state actors for genocide. And uh, so I don't think that is a problem. I mean, the Lord's Resistance Army is uh, a, a non-state actor and uh, we've managed to indict them, even if we haven't uh, captured Joseph Kony. We've captured his, one of his lieutenants. Uh, but uh, as I say, I don't think the non-state actors are a problem uh, other than to catch them. And uh, proportionality is a word that I wish I'd never heard of. Thank you. The chap at the back. Do you see Putin being indicted any time in the future? Well, look, I, when I was president of the Sierra Leone War Crimes Court, people said, well, you'll never get Charles Taylor. Uh, initially, he was the uh, president of Liberia. Then he went uh, protected by politicians, protected by a lot of money, to Nigeria. But when his friendship sprayed and his money ran out, um, he was handed over. So who knows what the future holds? I mean, uh, at the end of the day, these people, it's quite interesting if you, as arguing um, the case for the invalidation of amnesties in international law, and, and this came up. There is a country that offers refuge uh, and that is Saudi Arabia, who somehow think it's, uh, it's within their uh, principles of their charity uh, to give <coughs> refuge to every mass murdering uh, head of state who asked for it. They gave refuge to, to, to um, Idi Amin and two of his wives. They gave refuge to Ben Ali, who's there at the moment, uh, although the Tunisians want him. They gave refuge to uh, the head of Yemen. So uh, it may be that if Assad falls, that's where he'll go. Uh, and it will be, but it may be one day Saudi Arabia will uh, join the rest of the world in handing these people over, as Nigeria did. You, you just don't know. And Putin could fall and fall heavily and uh, might be prosecuted himself in Russia for uh, sending uh, so many uh, young Russians in, to some of them to be killed in Ukraine. Who knows? I mean, there are, uh, uh, as if you read um, the recent book that came out on Sergei Magnitsky, uh, it will expose a great deal of financially corrupt connections that uh, Mr. Putin is alleged to have, and it may be that that will be his undoing in relation to um, his uh, years to come uh, in a Russia that wants to get some of its money back. And uh, so it, it's difficult to uh, say never, but of course at the moment uh, he's uh, there preventing any proper investigation, let alone any prosecution, uh, of those who colluded in shooting down the Malaysian airliner. It's lady here. I'm um, Gita Segal from the Center for Secular Space. Um, I'm also the producer of a film that's more than 20 years old called The War Crimes File, which investigated killings in Bangladesh in 1971. Mm -hmm. And I I think that given the questions that have been raised as a result of your excellent talk um, about non-state actors not facing uh, justice, about the fact that the international tribunals are 
uh, <clears throat> intended to be tribunals of last resort, not substitute for national tribunals. I think it is a tragedy, given your reputation, that you dismiss the tribunal as simply trying people because they're leaders of the opposition parties. They are being tried because, and I know this because I investigated those tra those, uh, some of those people who were indicted myself, and I wasn't dependent on hearsay. I was in, uh, you know, we found witness, eyewitness evidence, uh, because they were leaders of death squads and so on at the time. I have to say, I'm against the death penalty. I've said so in many speeches to the young people who you mentioned who are, were calling for the death penalty. Um, but I do think that, that Bangladesh has a right to a national process using ideas of international law, which it itself helped to develop. Um, and I think that's a different thing from criticizing uh, the procedural aspects of the trial, many of which are deeply flawed. Uh, mixing up the two becomes an, uh, an, a sort of, becomes an argument for genocide denial. And I think it's a tragedy that the, every member of the British Bar who's commented on the International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh has commented only from the point of view of the defendants of the trial and not from the point of view of international justice more broadly. Well, I'm very glad you said that because uh, I've got several hundred copies of my report uh, which came out last week on the Bangladesh Tribunal and you can pick it up and read it for yourself. The first half of the report explains the appalling, what I consider to be one of the worst genocides committed by the Pakistani army in 1971, Operation Searchlight, where they went in, backed by Kissinger and Nixon and British and, and, British and American weapons, and they committed genocide. They committed genocide against the Hindu community. They committed genocide uh, without any doubt. And uh, it was only thanks to India and uh, to the Mukti Bahani, the, the freedom fighters, that eventually, uh, at the end of that year, that they won that particular war. And they, it didn't stop one of the, I think, the most disgusting, uh, events when it was quite clear that Bangladesh was going to come into being as a new nation a few days before the end of the war. Uh, it was perhaps some of these people, it was the Pakistani army who had the death list, but it was no doubt the Razakars and, and some of the people who may now be facing and in, be indicted and even sentenced to death by this court uh, came and they killed every teacher, every politician, every community leader, every writer, every artist they could lay their hands on so as to destroy the chance of uh, the leaders, this new nation, uh, getting up. And uh, I explain that and I do argue that it was utterly right to set up this court and I believe it should be, in fact, uh, that the problem is that there are many of the Pakistani perpetrators, 195 of them were identified at the time, who are still alive. And I believe the Security Council should take over the court and indict uh, those Pakistani soldiers who were in part responsible. Uh, but I do not accept that uh, these people, although they may be guilty, and I make no claim that they are innocent, I specifically uh, withhold any thought uh, or any suggestion that they might be innocent, but I do not believe that uh, they should almost all be sentenced to death because of the way the um, Bangladesh Supreme Court has interpreted uh, the law as requires almost mandatory uh, death sentence. Anyway, um, we can talk about uh, about that later, but I do, if you are interested in uh, this particular experiment with international justice, uh, by all means read my, my report. I've even suggested, because the man who was really responsible became Bhutto's uh, defense minister, and after, after they put Bhutto to death, um, he became, uh, he he's, was given a state funeral in the end. Uh, I think, uh, there is an argument, and an interesting argument, 
for actually not just trials in absentia, but posthumous trials where the evidence is still around, where the evidence is overwhelming, and where the individual has been wrongly honored by his own country. But anyway, it's, uh, that's one of the uh, perhaps provocative ideas that I uh, suggest in this report, which does uh, seek to uh, support the idea of retribution for that hideous crime of 1971, but doubts whether uh, sentencing people to death who happen to be opposition leaders, like it or not, uh, is, uh, is the way forward. Time for just a couple more questions. Chap at the back. Um, thank you very much for your excellent uh, speech. Um, my question relates to whether or not uh, we need to have a bit more realism about international criminal justice. And I say this specifically in the context of two cases. One that's finished, uh, the prosecutor versus Kenyatta, and another which you mentioned is upcoming, uh, that of the case of Israel-Palestine. Um, I'm sorry? I, sorry? Which is the upcoming case? Uh, 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 the investigation into the recent uh, conflict in Gaza. Right. Um, if we look at the case of the prosecutor first in Kenyatta, we can take the line of the prosecutor that you have uh, aired here earlier, um, that it was all to do with the interference of witnesses. I think the evidence is much stronger to suggest that the investigation and the prosecution uh, by the office of the prosecutor was um, wholly insufficient, um, almost embarrassingly bad, um, and a failure to, to, to follow the duty of the Rome Statute. Um, uh, and I think that is why charges were dropped. Um, because if there had been sufficient evidence, if there had been a sufficient investigation, surely we would have now been in the trial stage. So given that uh, inadequate, uh, ineffective, and, and almost amateuristic approach, shouldn't we call upon the office of the prosecutor and all who care about international criminal justice to turn it around? Because if we have that type of amateurism applied in an investigation of Israeli generals and politicians, surely we will see another dropping of cases and we will, we will see the impunity that uh, Israel uh, has had in their crimes in Ghana continued and legitimized by the international criminal justice, uh, thereby undermining the entire uh, project of international criminal justice. I agree. I, actually, I'm very critical of the prosecutor, and I'm waiting for a book by Lionel Nichols, which is coming out shortly, uh, on the whole Kenyatta Ruto process to see just whether that concern is justified. There is a view that the prosecutor should not have taken it in the first place and was under some pressure to do so and should have been uh, absolutely strict on the complementarity principle. And uh, there were courts in Kenya that should have dealt with it. However, that wasn't the case, and I, don't, uh, I wouldn't rush to judgment uh, on this prosecutor. Uh, there have been a number of criticisms of her predecessor for being uh, more keen to get in on the act and to satisfy uh, journalists than to actually do the hard work and set up. Um, but you've got to be aware that a court without a country a court without a police system, a court without access in many cases to the evidence is going to have difficulties. The, the Darfur investigation was incredibly difficult because they were, they were denied access, they were uh, uh, suffered all sorts of uh, problems. So uh, one shouldn't be too quick to um, judge, but it will it certainly, uh, it is, something that uh, the Kenyatta case will be mulled over and, and the books coming out will enable, I think, uh, hopefully, um, constructive criticism and, and better prosecution uh, services. But we should be aware of the difficulties and sometimes dangers that we're putting people in. My name is Nastasia. I'm a third year law student at SARS. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting lecture. I have two questions for you. 
Um, the first relates to increasing the legitimacy of international justice. Um, I interned on the Karadzic case last summer, mm. and one thing that struck me was that <coughs> on the second day of the closing arguments, the gallery was almost empty, so it had seemed as if the press <laughs> had also gotten sick of the case by mm. that time. Um, when I went to Sarajevo speaking with people on the ground, I noticed that they were also um, very disdainful of the ICTY itself because they felt that if the UN really wanted to do something for them, they should have done it or could have done so earlier. So my question is, if um, the purpose of international law is not just to combat immunity, Im impunity, but also to provide um, victims to war crimes, uh, justice to war crimes victims, how can we achieve that? or better achieve that. And the second question relates to the definition of genocide. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that there is no legal requirement of a plan or a state policy, although the ICTR and ICTY jurisprudence suggests that it can be useful in um, discovering a perpetrator's special intent, but I think if the purpose of the Genocide Convention is to protect groups, then the theory of a lone genocidaire would um, seem, to, seem to be quite counterintuitive. So how do you think we can improve the definition of genocide in that respect? Thanks. I think that's a fascinating question on genocide. Uh, as for your first question, I'll come back to it. As for your first question on Karadzic, I'm interested that the press has lost interest. Um, but, you know, international criminal justice began by almost pandering to the media. It needed to actually strut its stuff out there. It needed to persuade people that this was a possibility. And I think it did that rather well in the end then it had to provide fair trials. And that was a, a real problem because the judges bent over backwards to help the defendants. Um, you, Milosevic, for example, got three QCs to assist him, even though he pretended he didn't want any. He had a whole pile of lawyers in the gallery, but because, but he wanted to play the media as well. He wanted to be a standalone figure to, which would so suit the Serbian idea of they're up against the wall. And uh, so he insisted on being pictured alone, without a lawyer, and defending himself, even though, as I say, he had all his lawyers in the gallery out of the camera shot. So there are these games that are played. And uh, while there is no doubt that Mladic bears prime responsibility for the massacre at, Sarri, at, at Srebrenica, uh, the case of Karadzic is more interesting and, and not so straightforward, and it's a pity that it's uh, gone off the boil, but no doubt books will be written on it once the judgment comes in uh, after the inevitable appeal. Genocide is a real lawyer's debate at the moment because we have this problem of proving genocidal intent. And uh, there was a, a view that went around some years ago that you needed to be able to prove a direction to kill. Um, and you couldn't. You ca can't even do that with the Holocaust. If you look at the evidence for the uh, planning of the Holocaust, it's basically Adolf Eichmann's uh, Wannsee conference <coughs> minutes which talks of um, relocating uh, Jews to the east and talks of um, uh, helping them, uh, talks of their abandoned property and so on. It is uh, a document which is um, elliptical and, and uh, most, uh, you very rarely find documents uh, like uh, the Night and Fog decrees with Goering's signature on them as far as the um, extermination of uh, the Jews. So uh, we don't 
look now for uh, orders, we don't look for plans, but we draw inferences of the specific intent that is required for genocide. And there is a lot of debate about whether we really do need the crime of genocide, whether we simply can't get away with charging crime against humanity since genocide is uh, simply the worst crime against humanity. But um, if you go back to the theorists, to Raphael Lemkin and others, and the genocide scholars do believe that genocide is uh, a crime of its own because there are uh, such a nationalism, the dehumanizing of racial and religious minorities uh, and uh, their extermination that does make it worth keeping genocide as a crime. The practical reason, of course, for keeping genocide as a, cri as a crime is that the Genocide Convention uh, requires action. The use of the G word, which Turkey so avoids, which Britain and the United States so disgracefully and disgustingly avoided in 1996 when the Tutsis were being hacked to death, um, does require action. And uh, that it, it is a particularly useful convention because it's one of the few that the United States has ratified. And the ratification was uh, quite an extraordinary thing because uh, it happened in 1986 and it was partly due to a young, obese, bearded protester from Flint, Michigan, who heard that Ronald Reagan as president was visiting Bitburg Cemetery, which had SS graves. So he jumped on a plane with a friend and they made banners, uh, Reagan honors the SS, and uh, held it there as Reagan visited the cemetery. And the, the news went around the world. The pictures of uh, them holding their banners up uh, infuriated the Jewish lobby in America, which uh, got into action. And three weeks after his return, Ronald Reagan ratified the Genocide Convention. And the young, obese, bearded protester from Flint, Michigan was, of course, Michael Moore. Making his, making his first and I think still most effective protest. Right, the, the wine is uncorked, but I've, I've promised three more questions. Um, there's someone at the back with the microphone there, yes. Um, yeah, I actually, I wanted to ask something about Sudan. So um, anyone that follows Sudanese politics knows that in the east of Sudan, the Blue Nile area is completely on fire. In the west, obviously, we have Darfur. Um, in the south, there's a civil violence maybe leading to civil war. So since Ocampo has given up on Sudan, how can we believe in international justice as more than a concept when it really hasn't done anything for us on the ground? And my second question, even though I know the answer is quite obvious, but I'd still love to hear what you have to say. Do you think Bush and Blair will ever be indicted for war crimes committed during the war on terror? I'm sorry, you'll have to repeat uh, at least the second question because I, I couldn't hear from all the movement. Do you think Bush and Blair will ever be indicted for war crimes committed during the war on terror? Who should be indicted? Bush and Blair and his Who best friend. Bush and Blair. Yeah. Bush, Bush and Blair. <laughs> oh, Bush and Blair. Oh, <laughs> there's two, yes. Do you want to answer that one? No, I'll just hear this. Oh, one. okay, this last one then. Okay. Thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, uh, lecture. <coughs> I have two questions. The first one, uh, what do you think about the Mary Marmara affairs and the report of the uh, prosecutor on this matter? Uh, which matter? The Mavi Marma, the assault of the, on the flotilla directed to Gaza. Oh, the flotilla, uh, yeah. 
Okay, and the second question uh, is, uh, what do you think about the ICJ attitude uh, about genocide, also in the light of the recent decision uh, in uh, Croatia against Serbia? Thank you. And lastly, which will be one question, I hope. Yes, all right. It's on? Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm sympathetic with the Americans on capital punishment, though I might want to include some American presidents in the dock. But if we can't have capital punishment, rather than free board and lodging, colour TV, uh, lovely gyms and conjugal visits, could we not at least have hard labour? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, the flotilla to Gaza uh, was a, a terrible incident. It was a one-off, and it's difficult for international justice to get at one-offs because the crime against humanity definition requires uh, widespread and systematic crimes, and uh, a one-off event isn't. You can maybe get one-off genocide because you have, uh, if you have a large group that is destroyed, uh, that was the case with Srebrenica. But uh, the flotilla is difficult to bring in. As to the ICJ decision on uh, Croatia and Serbia, I thought it was rather a hand-washing exercise. They didn't want to bring in a judgment to favor either side, and so they rather turned their back on the evidence and said that we can't have, uh, we can't infer genocidal intent. It is true, and I mean, this is what they did, it was make the distinction that courts have made before, but be between ethnic cleansing and <laughs> genocide. Uh, it is not necessarily genocide to embark upon ethnic cleansing. But the Genocide Convention, largely because of the Armenian case, which involved both deportation of entire racial group and the seizure of their property, but deportation across hundreds of miles of desert uh, without food, without medicine, um, and ending up in concentration camps where typhus was... was um, running and, and so half, a little over half, the Armenian race was uh, exterminated. Uh, that brought into the, gen the um, Genocide Convention uh, the phrase, I just, I'm trying to remember it is, um, genocide is committed by um, creating conditions of life that cannot be sustained because of racial and religious reasons. So subjecting a race or a religion to unsustainable conditions of life, uh, such as sending them on death marches, uh, would amount to genocide. But ethnic cleansing of the kind that Milosevic did to uh, the Albanians in just, in fact, setting them on the road uh, is not uh, a genocide as such. So, um, Bush and Blair, well, we are getting a crime of aggression uh, of which they're guilty, uh, but we're not getting it to 2017, and it's not going to be backdated to 2003. So I fear that Bush and Blair will probably evade uh, capture and uh, they won't be in the dock anytime soon. Although I have to say that ex-President Bush is, uh, uh, has been very careful in his travel plans not to enter any European country that might uh, uh, be persuaded to indict him under a universal jurisdiction theory. Uh, but uh, I think Mr. Blair will be safe in Kazakhstan and uh, other of his clients, and certainly safe in Israel. Um, the uh, bring back hard labor, well, that is one possibility. I think I prefer, all told, to 
send them all to the Falklands, where they can be, there'll be one use of the Falkland Islands. <laughs> they can uh, commune with penguins and never be heard of again. <laughs>